battle against the ferocious Atlantic. Safe passage through treacherous waters, an engineering feat that many believed impossible. Now, the Cape Cod Canal on Modern Marvels. Cape Cod is a 70-mile-long finger of land steeped in history and romance. But the waters around the Cape are home to violent storms, dense fogs, and shifting sands. For hundreds of years, they were a mariner's nightmare. Throughout America's short maritime history, thousands of ships sank, foundered, or were destroyed on the shoals and rocky shores of Cape Cod. But today, ships no longer have to brave these treacherous waters, thanks to the world's widest sea-level canal, spanning 480 feet from shore to shore. The Cape Cod Canal. There are no locks in the 17.4-mile canal, but there are natural obstacles that have at times proven disastrous. But without the canal, maritime traffic would be tremendously altered. The canal saves on the order of 150 miles, 130 miles, depending on which track a vessel would take. But more important than the mileage, I think, is the safety of the canal. The canal wasn't a luxury. It was a necessity. Built for two-way traffic, the canal is composed of a land cut that is seven miles long, with open water channels on either end. One channel extends into Buzzards Bay, and the other into Cape Cod Bay. Operated and maintained by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the Cape Cod Canal uses a state-of-the-art marine traffic control system, monitoring an average of 20,000 vessels each year. Commercial and private vessels up to 825 feet long use the canal 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Any vessel longer than 825 feet would have extreme difficulty maneuvering inside the two-way traffic land cut and isn't allowed inside the canal. Since the canal essentially made Cape Cod an island, three bridges were built to span the canal and link Cape Cod to the rest of Massachusetts. Two highway bridges, the Sagamore Bridge and Bourne Bridge, and the Buzzards Bay Railroad Bridge. More than 36 million vehicles pass over the Sagamore and Bourne Bridges every year. The Buzzards Bay Railroad Bridge was the longest vertical lift bridge in the world at the time of its construction. Now used mostly for hauling refuse off the Cape, the Railroad and Buzzards Bay Railroad Bridge are still vital to Cape Cod's infrastructure. Although fewer than five operators man the Buzzards Bay Railroad Bridge, an average of 46 Army Corps of Engineers employees work on the canal. From marine traffic control to bridge maintenance to educational services for the community, the Army Corps of Engineers has had stewardship of the canal for over three quarters of a century. We get all kinds of shipping traffic. We have a large number of tugs and barges that come through the canal as well as passenger vessels, bulk carrying ships, ships that might carry coal or cement, tankers of course. The largest product that comes through the canal are oil, petrochemical products. In the Marine Traffic Control Center, located in Buzzards Bay, all commercial vessels and private vessels 65 feet or larger are tracked and monitored. There are safety issues in the canal. The current in the canal being the primary concern, current can run as much as 5.2 knots, and it changes direction every six hours with the tide. The ocean's tides, the cyclical changes in sea level caused by the sun's and moon's gravitational pulls, have a profound influence on the canal. The current in the canal is caused by two different tide cycles, one north of the Cape and the other south of the Cape. The rise and fall of the tide south of the Cape is only four feet, and the rise and fall of the tide north of the Cape is nine feet. The five-foot difference in tide levels on opposite ends of the canal generates a swift current as the rising water flows downhill. 
The current then reverses direction as the Cape's tide cycle continues. Sophisticated hardware and software monitor vessel movement and environmental conditions. This is environmental data at the five reporting stations, namely the wind speed, the wind direction, and the state of the tide, which is critical for the deep draft vessels who use our canal. We monitor the tides 24 hours a day in order to allow deep draft vessels to go through. The critical function of the Marine Traffic Control Station is to maintain a safe waterway for both the deep draft commercial vessels and the private recreational vessels. As you can see, we're tracking two westbound vessels and one eastbound vessel. Tracking number 213, his course is 270 degrees true, he's, he's going west, and his speed is 7 knots. I'll click on the westbounder and we'll find that the vessels will meet in 48 minutes. They'll meet between the two highway bridges. Deep draft vessels can't meet each other under any of the bridges. Marine traffic control must calculate the vessel's speeds and communicate where on the canal the vessels can meet. On the canal itself, Army Corps patrol boats police the waterway, ready to assist any vessel and maintain a safe marine environment. This boat has two 435 horsepower Caterpillar uh, diesels and the other two patrol boats have two 430 horsepower Cummins diesels. This is pretty significant power. This is a 40 footer, the other two are 41s. These boats every now and then have kept tug and barges from hitting the riprap or turned a tug and barge around in here. So they have uh, pretty good horsepower for a boat their size. Anything that loses power or becomes disabled in the canal, we consider an emergency. We get there as quick as we can. There could be a large ship coming around the uh, bend. There could be a tug and barge coming around the bend. With the way the current runs, if we don't get to them quickly, they're going to be aground or they're going to be hitting one of the bridge abutments. Although patrol boats are able to assist large commercial craft, many private boats become distressed in the canal. The patrol boats handle about 200, and, well, last year they handled 228 small boat assistance cases, and uh, around 200 is the normal. Marine Operations also works closely with the Bay Colony Railroad operators on one of the more unique elements of the canal, the Vertical Lift Railroad Bridge. Most bridges of this type would normally be in a down position for railroad traffic. However, being the major waterway, the bridge is always left in the up position. Larry Janander has worked as one of the railroad bridge operators for 23 years. When the bridge needs to move, his is the voice that makes the first call. Traffic control. Look, uh, we're ready to make that move to check that uh, Jeep brake problem with the PLC. OK, Larry. Whether it's a train or whether it's maintenance moves, we call the Army Corps of Engineers Marine Traffic Control Center. And the officer in charge, in turn, lets us know whether we can bring the bridge down or not. I have one uh, westbound fishing vessel. Susie clears, I'll have the boat out, we'll drop it. When Marine Traffic Control gives the OK, a patrol boat is sent out on the upcurrent side of the bridge to stop any vessel traffic. The span is 544 feet. The span weighs 2,200 ton. We also have counterweights on the north and south sides that weigh 1,100 ton each, which gives you a balance of weight. Then with our total movement, we also have cables. There is 40 cables on the north side, 40 on the south side. And with those moving as well, we're moving actually around 4,800 ton. It takes approximately two and a half minutes to lower the bridge from its home 135 feet above mean high tide. <coughs> Vessels on the canal must stem the tide and wait for the patrol boat to give the okay for passage. There are two sets of 16-foot diameter shivs, four in each tower. Several small motors in each tower initiate the movement of the shivs, which in turn move the counterweights and 
the bridge span. This is the machinery room. And what we have here that my hand is on is actually, a, as, as it says, a uh, cooling fan for the 200 horsepower motor, which is motor A. And this motor is a 200 horsepower DC motor. And we have our B motor, which is also a 200 horsepower motor. The south tower looks exactly like this with two more motors, and there would be C and D motors. The Bay Colony Railroad train typically crosses the bridge four times a day. When the train has completed its crossing, usually 20 minutes, the bridge operator raises the bridge and then lets marine traffic control know when the bridge span is locked in its up position. Vessel traffic can once again proceed under the bridge. But the workings of this canal and its bridges have not always been so finely tuned. The evolution of the canal was long, painful, and dangerous. The Sagamore and Bourne bridges see a combined total of approximately 70,000 daily trips in winter. During the summer, the traffic nearly doubles with over 130,000 daily trips. Cape Cod Canal will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to the Cape Cod Canal on Modern Marvels. Cape Cod was formed thousands of years ago by Ice Age glaciers. It's home to fierce storms deadly ice flows and hidden shoals. The Great New England Hurricane of 1938 killed nearly 700. Top winds were clocked at 183 miles per hour, but it wasn't a unique event. Hurricanes have lashed this area every few years, but a possible safe haven for ships was always nearby. At the entrance to the Cape Cod Peninsula, a narrow isthmus separated two tidal rivers. On the northeast side of the isthmus, there was a vast salt marsh where the Scusset River flowed through. On the southwest side, the Monument River flowed inland, nearly meeting the Scusset River. Between the two rivers was approximately a one-mile stretch of dry land. Captain Miles Standish of the Plymouth Colony first introduced the idea for a canal to cut across the Cape Cod Isthmus in 1623 to facilitate trade between the Native American Indians and the burgeoning colonies. The colonists' survival depended on their relationship with the Native American Indians. Standish knew the Indians walked their boats across the narrow isthmus. He wanted a water crossing. But with no way to implement such an undertaking, the idea of building a canal was abandoned. Until 1776, when George Washington envisioned a secure route for his Navy battling the British. The British Navy commanded the waters off the Cape, thus blockading the small Continental Navy from passing. Washington's Navy moved goods and men by foot over the Isthmus to bypass the British Navy. But another century would pass before the canal Washington desired became a reality. As the country grew, shipping increased each year between the major ports of Boston and New York. We had all sorts of products in this country that were being shipped by a huge coastal industry that grew rapidly after the Civil War. And they would run across surging tides and ice flows that were very dangerous. Approximately 1,100 ships founded and were lost. Of this 1,100 ships, approximately 200 were complete losses. And there were about 150 lives lost. As the loss of life and cargo increased, so did attempts at building a canal on the Cape. With the success of the Erie Canal in the north, nearly half a dozen companies tried but failed to conquer the small Cape Cod Isthmus. It wasn't until 1909 that technology and entrepreneurship in the form of August Belmont Jr. caught up with the notion of building a canal. August Belmont was born on Cape Cod and became famous for financing the first subway in New York City, completed in 1904. He was ready for his next project. He purchased a struggling company trying to build a canal on Cape Cod. The Boston, Cape Cod, and New York Canal Company. He always said he would complete the canal at any cost, and it was to protect mariners. Interestingly enough, 
commerce was always the last thing he spoke about. It was always protection of the seamen, navigational rights for the military, and then commerce. Belmont immediately hired the renowned civil engineer, William Barclay Parsons, to be his chief engineer on the project. He had been one of those commissioned by Theodore Roosevelt originally to go down to survey the route of the Panama Canal. And he had helped August Belmont build the 4th Avenue, the first subway in New York. And so he was a friend and also a, a professional. He was hired in 1905 to be in charge of the building of the Cape Cod Canal. Construction began in ceremonial fashion on June 22, 1909. Few believed this latest attempt at a canal would be successful. However, Belmont promised not to desert the task until the last shovelful has been dug. First, Parsons would try to construct a breakwater off the eastern end of what would become the canal. If he failed here, the canal would likely be doomed as sand caught in the constantly moving currents would immediately fill any dredged channel. He used schooners to ship millions of tons of granite boulders from Maine to the breakwater site. He wouldn't stop until his breakwater was 40 feet deep, 3,000 feet long, and rose eight feet above high tide. It would take years. At the opposite end of the isthmus in Buzzards Bay, dredges worked on the westerly approach. The recent industrial revolution had mechanized the ancient skill of dredging. The dredges at Parson's disposal were much more powerful than any that had come before. First dredge to arrive was the Kennedy. It arrived at the West End, and it was a ladder-type dredge. Now, a ladder-type dredge looks like a conveyor belt with little buckets on it. It goes in, and it digs away, digs away, and it expels the material to the rear onto a scow. The scow takes it away. Parsons' plan for dredging would follow the paths of the rivers, simultaneously dredging from the east and west ends of the isthmus until the dredges presumed meeting in the middle. Although the plan was sound, Parsons was about to face an enormous problem, courtesy of the last ice age. From the beginning, Parsons knew that Cape Cod was a glacial moraine, a glacial dump, if you will. So he ran test borings, lots of them, and they went down 40, 50 feet and never found, struck any boulders. But oh, did they find them when the dredges started digging. The only solution was to employ a new breed of worker to do a new kind of job, an extremely dangerous job. Dredging was halted, so underwater divers could dynamite the obstructions. The 1820s had opened the seas to work and exploration with the development of diving pumps and underwater helmets. The equipment was heavy and airflow had to be carefully monitored. Laboring for prolonged periods underwater was more perilous than any other work on the canal. Some of the rock at the west end exceeded 100 tons. The diving profession at that time wasn't what we would consider today to be the safest. The air pumps usually were run by hand they were on leaky scows. The divers were really brave, and they'd have to go down into very murky water, and they would blast anywhere from seven and a half pounds to 200 pounds of dynamite. It was very, very dangerous. Once they'd set the charge and have it ready, they'd have to get back up on the boat, back the boat off, blast. Once it's blasted, they'd have to go back down again to survey to see where they'd have to dig. And this became extremely time-consuming. Although dredging was severely delayed, work on the three bridges that Belmont was obligated to build as part of his canal charter progressed rapidly. There would be two highway bridges, the Bourne Bridge and Sagamore Bridge. They would combine space for a trolley line and the dominant form of transportation at the time, horse and carriage. Both highway bridges would incorporate two 80-foot cantilever spans constructed of wood and steel. Each was completed in less than a year. Parsons decided on a different style for the third bridge, a railroad bridge. It would only have a single span. The railroad bridge had a single counterweight, which was on the north side. It was a bascule-type bridge, and so it would just open and close like that. By 1912, the bridges were finished, but the canal was not. Drastically behind schedule, 
Belmont and Parsons implemented a new plan to dig in the dry in the unexcavated center of the planned canal route. They moved in steam shovels, similar to those being used in the Panama Canal excavation, and set up a narrow gauge railroad to haul the debris away. Belmont's desire to get the job done at any cost resulted in his contracting for two specially built dipper dredges to be assembled on site at the west end and the east end of the canal. They were special because at the time they were the biggest dredges in the country. These dredges were monsters. They had 13 steam engines in each one of them. They had a dipper dredge that was almost twice the size of any dipper dredge that was operating in the canal at that time. The two behemoths began digging toward each other in 1912. Accompanied by the trusty Kennedy ladder dredge and many smaller dipper dredges, Belmont was nearing his goal. There were approximately 26 dredges worked from the time of the first dredge that started to work around 1908 till the last dredge pulled out of here in 1916. By the spring of 1914, only one sandy stretch of land separated the tidal rivers. Workers dug through the sand and constructed a wooden dike to keep the water separated. In a ceremonial blending of the waters, Belmont and Parsons shook hands, lifted the dike's gate, and let the torrential waters flood the canal area. Dredges would soon finish the job of widening and deepening the final stretch of land, and on July 29, 1914, the Cape Cod Canal opened with great fanfare. 20 million cubic yards of material had been removed, and Cape Cod had become an island. The canal had cost Belmont $16 million. His plan was to charge tolls for all vessels using the canal. With schooner barges carrying coal and large passenger steamships coming in droves, he was certain his canal would be a financial success. However, it soon became clear that the canal was too small. Although Parsons had conducted extensive studies, the canal depth of 25 feet and width of 140 feet proved to be inadequate. There wasn't enough room in the canal for vessels to maneuver. Furthermore, the narrow width actually increased the velocity of the current. One of the problems was the cross rips and when the tide changed. If a pilot who was captaining the ship through the canal wasn't on his game, he would find that he'd be into the shore very quickly. It was difficult to navigate. The approach channel through Buzzards Bay took a series of sharp turns and in combination with the strong currents made many mariners weary. The shipwrecks started to accumulate. Vessels couldn't navigate the strong current and would crash into one of the bridges or run aground on the riprap, erosion protection rock that lines the shores. Each time there was a wreck, the canal had to close to traffic, which meant a loss of revenue and additional trepidation in ship captains. Ships were soon taking chances with the old sea route around the Cape instead of paying the toll and risking the unpredictable canal. Belmont's Grand Canal, one which no one else had been able to build, was a financial failure. Could Belmont find a way to get off his sinking ship? Cape Cod Canal visionary August Belmont Jr. built Belmont Park Racetrack, home to the Belmont Stakes, and helped build two America's Cup winning yachts. Cape Cod Canal will return on Modern Marvels. Return to the Cape Cod Canal on Modern Marvels. Today's Cape Cod Canal is far different than the one August Belmont built a century ago. His canal was plagued by racing tidal surges and shipwrecks. Although he periodically dredged the canal, it was fundamentally flawed. Up until his death in 1924, Belmont tried to rid himself of the canal, which had proven to be his money pit. Belmont's canal was an economic failure. The amount of traffic they saw in the canal was much less than what investors had anticipated. There was only one party interested in purchasing the canal. In March of 1928, the canal was finally sold to the federal government for $11.4 million, 4.6 million less than what it cost Belmont to build. Weeks later, Congress handed the Cape Cod Canal over to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to operate and improve. Passage would be free to the maritime public. 
A lot of people wonder why the Corps of Engineers is here at the canal. The Corps of Engineers nationwide has a, a civil works function where we perform work as authorized by Congress. And that's, that's how the Corps got here to the canal. Uh, Congress made the decision to purchase the, the then private canal and turn it into a viable waterway. The Corps worked with shipping companies, other maritime users of the canal, and local businesses to discern the major problems that plagued the passage. They then went forward with a whole series of surveys, what they could do to improve the condition of the canal, what they could do to improve the navigability of the canal, the safety requirements, and what did they want the canal to ultimately be. All the problems the canal had came down to one cause. It was just too small. As the Army Corps of Engineers was drawing up plans for this major waterway project, FDR's New Deal gave it the push that it needed. In December 1933, the federal government allotted nearly $6 million to widen the canal and build three bigger and better bridges. Belmont's bridges would simply be obstacles in a wider canal. The government decided we will make a WPA project, a federal work project out of this. And they said we will make this into a modern canal. It meant that 400 local men, heads of households, they had to be married men with families, were hired by the WPA. And it made it so that if you wanted a job, you could get a job. The pay wasn't great, but at least you were working. And it added to the economy of the Commonwealth. The first order of business was to begin work on the bridges. The old bridges were still open and still operating for the railroad and the two highway bridges until the new bridges were completed. While the old bridges were drawbridge style, the two new highway bridges were both planned to be fixed bridges. They would be designed to provide enough clearance for the tallest of ocean-going vessels. Simultaneous construction began on all three bridges in 1933. With a dedicated workforce, the Sagamore and Bourne Bridge construction moved swiftly. The differences between the two highway bridges are, are, are just the length of the approach spans. Most people think of them as being identical, but the Bourne Bridge is longer than the Sagamore Bridge. The Bourne Bridge is 2,384 feet long, and the Sagamore is 1,408 feet long. The highway bridges are elevated in design they allow for a clearance of 135 feet from the bottom of the bridge to the top of the water at mean high tide. The engineers made the new bridges four lanes wide instead of two, and 40 feet from curb to curb, more than 10 feet wider than Belmont's bridges. Workers completed the Bourne and Sagamore bridges just two years after the start of construction. But one bridge remained to be built. The most difficult was to build the railway bridge. They had to go in and engineer the whole project so that everything went together like a fine geared meshed machine. The original Bascule Railroad Bridge was too small to span the new canal. It was also built to remain in the lowered position until a boat needed to pass. This would impede the goal of the new canal, which was to always have an open waterway. So the Army Corps plans called for the construction of a vertical lift railroad bridge, meaning the entire center span could be raised and lowered as needed. This ambitious proposition gave rise to the longest vertical lift railroad bridge in the world at the time. The movable bridge span would cover a distance of 544 feet. Such a large movable span meant that they could link the two sides of the proposed 500-foot wide canal. The way the railroad bridge was constructed, as with all the bridges along the canal, there were two teams, one team on the mainland side and one team on the Cape side, and they would build simultaneously and then meet in the middle, which is an amazing engineering feat. This method of construction allowed the canal to stay open for vessel traffic and required most of the work to be done on dry land. Foundation work began with the building of coffer dams. This would allow a dry work site for construction of the bridge piers. They had to go down 62 feet below sea level to dig, but they ran into the exact same problems that August Belmont and Parsons had run into, boulders. 
engineers suggested an ingenious solution to deal with boulders. Revised designs called for 324 oak piles, 38 to 40 feet long, and capable of bearing 30 tons each. These piles were driven into the ground, surrounded by the coffer dams, until they hit boulders, an average distance of 45 feet below mean sea level. The coffer dams were then filled with concrete, and the channel piers were subsequently built on top of these sturdy pier bases. This was a monumental task, and it was beautifully done. They had to go down to this great depth with the piers because of the weight, not only of the railway tracks, but of the superstructure that was there. This substructure was completed on the Buzzards Bay Railroad Bridge in January 1935. That same year in March, work began on the superstructure, the steelwork of the bridge. Workers used over 4,000 tons of steel, and approximately 110,000 steel rivets in constructing the bridge. Now the Corps had a problem. It needed to close the canal during construction of the bridge span, but wanted to minimize the time of the closure. Though not successful, the canal was still a benefit to mariners. The Army Corps would build the bridge span in sections, then rapidly assemble them. Engineers worked with 18 panels, divided into three sections. At roadway level, workers assembled one section of six panels from the North Tower, then another section of six panels from the South. The third section, or midsection, linked the other two and completed the bridge. This process took 90 workers only five days to complete. With their fingers crossed, engineers successfully raised the center span of the world's widest vertical lift bridge on September 16, 1935. Unlike most railroad bridges, the span here at the canal is kept in the raised position. Um, again, that's because navigation has the, the right of way. With a crew of five workers, the four motors triggered the movement of the shivs, activating the movement of the two counterweights, and the span was successfully lowered for the first train crossing in December 1935. Now began the task of widening the canal. It was up to the engineers to harness the forces of the tides and create a safe waterway for all types of vessels. But could they truly improve upon Belmont's and Parsons' efforts? Some locals wanted the canal to be filled in when the Army Corps of Engineers took it over in 1928. The Big Ditch, as some called it, actually split the town of Bourne in half. The Cape Cod Canal will return on Modern Marvels. Cod Canal on Modern Marvels. The uncompromising Atlantic around Cape Cod has garnered the respect of mariners since the first vessel sailed her waters. Both the Gulf Stream and the Labrador Current run nearby and affect ocean waters that swirl around the Cape. These currents, combined with the contrasting tide levels on opposite ends of the canal, create the rapid flow of water that alternates direction with each new tide. The current will run to the west for six hours, and then it will go into slack water, and we have like 15, 20 minutes of slack water where the current isn't really moving at all, and then the current changes direction, and it will run the other direction for six hours. So every day there's two east currents, two west currents. In the 1930s, engineers faced the daunting challenge of transforming this unusual and potentially hazardous waterway into a safe and navigable canal. One possibility was to build locks, which had proven successful in the massive Panama Canal project. Navigation locks are gated enclosures that vessels enter. They then fill with water so that the vessel may pass from level to level. Thus, engineers can still raging currents. Parsons said that it would never need locks. Now, you have to remember that Parsons also had said at Panama, you don't need locks. But one of the primary reasons was it would slow transportation through the canal. The very simple reason for not building locks was that they wanted to keep this as an open seaway. The experience in the north with canals, all sorts of canals in Pennsylvania, Virginia, New York State, like the Erie Canal and so forth, was that all these many canals that we had, and many here in Massachusetts too, would freeze in the wintertime. 
The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers hired the Massachusetts Institute of Technology to build a model of the canal with modifiable dimensions. Scientists and engineers studied tides and water levels created by an electrical water control system. The hydraulic data provided the Army Corps with solid facts on which to determine the dimensions of the canal. The MIT data also illuminated serious cross-current and eddy conditions in the approach channel within Buzzards Bay that could create desperate conditions for ocean vessels. Engineers decided to build dikes composed of dredged material along the approach to the Buzzards Bay entrance of the canal. Because dikes are barriers built to redirect water, they would help reduce the swift current and lessen sand buildup. The new dikes would also eliminate a few very sharp turns in Buzzards Bay that had proven disastrous in Belmont's canal. With modern dredging equipment and modern dynamiting equipment, they made a straight channel into the west end of the canal. They chopped Hog Island, which was right in the middle of the entrance in Buzzards Bay, right in half. The Army Corps began a massive dredging operation to widen, deepen, and adjust the entire canal and its approaches. Engineers also needed to prevent the sandy banks of the canal from eroding. Riprap was placed on both sides of the seven-mile land cut. Riprap lines the sides of the canal, and it's granite rock that's placed along the banks and it's placed there to keep wakes of vessels from washing the banks out and also the strong current from making the banks erode. About 54 million cubic yards of material were removed for the Cape Cod Canal. About 15 million cubic yards of that was during Belmont's Canal and the rest during the reconstruction. The entire restoration of the canal, including the construction of the three new bridges, took only seven years. Completed in 1940, the new and improved canal was to become a saving grace to the maritime community, especially the military, preparing for an impending war. During World War II, the U.S. Navy found the Cape Cod Canal an essential passage in which to skirt the lingering enemy submarines positioned off the eastern seaboard. Convoys of military vessels from New York carrying troops and supplies moved through the canal. Vessels would anchor in Buzzards Bay awaiting the okay to pass through. The Cape Cod Canal made a major reputation for itself with the government forces fighting the war. Because what we had at Buzzards Bay was a staging area. And the staging area was protected by minefields to make sure the German submarines couldn't get through. Because the great threat in the oceans, of course, was the uh, German undersea boats. Over the next seven decades, the canal would endure wars, weather, and a growing population. It would also incorporate burgeoning technology to remain a vital component of maritime transport. The canal has successfully stood the test of time, but will the mass of humanity that travels over the two highway bridges each year and invades the shore every season become too great a burden for an aging infrastructure? In the first seven months after the U.S. entered World War II, five Allied ships were sunk by German U-boats within 100 miles of the Cape Cod Canal. The Cape Cod Canal will return on Modern Marvels. The new millennium has introduced new technology and new fears to almost every facet of the country's infrastructure. The Cape Cod Canal is no exception. Today, all three Cape Cod Canal bridges are monitored with surveillance cameras on a 24-7 basis from the same control center that monitors the canal itself. Since 9-11, Homeland Security has affected any project that the Corps has with a lot of infrastructure, and of course it's affected us. Now we have electronic equipment that can see places around the bridges that we never monitored remotely before. We're keeping an eye on things a lot closer than we ever did before, just like everybody else is. Along with security monitoring, all three bridges are routinely inspected and maintained. The maintenance of the bridge is continuous. Uh, there's always something in it that needs doing. The Bourne Bridge is right now in the process of being painted. The process of removing the, the paint is uh, 
you know, quite complicated. Everything has to be contained. We wind up uh, setting up a whole system of containment to stop any of the painting debris from getting to the canal or getting to the local grounds. Suspended from uh, from inspection cells, we have the steel decking that's the bottom portion of our containment. We have tarps that we stretch along the sides of the bridge from the curb line all the way down to the steel decking. Um, that will fully enclose the area that we will be sandblasting. Total containment of the area being sandblasted is a necessity because the old lead paint is toxic. This is an area of the bridge that we haven't did any paint, paint work on yet this year. And if you look over here, you can see the, the typical rust areas. And as I said before, this is a, a lead removal project. And anytime you see the, the orange here in that, that paint, you know that that's uh, the red lead primer. And that's what we, we have to take all that off. And the paint there is, oh, it's pretty thick. And we've got 26 mils there of paint. So we got a lot of work to do. All right, now we're on the other side of the containment in an area of the bridge that was painted uh, about four or five months ago before the winter set in. And you can see there's quite a difference in the quality of the paint. Painting and maintenance on the two fixed bridges are one thing, but on the movable span of the railroad bridge, it's far more difficult. Within the last few years, we've renovated this bridge. It's taken about three years and 25, 26 million dollars to renovate it. The first portion of the renovation was a complete lead uh, paint removal project. That lasted for approximately two years, and then we had a mechanical rehab that lasted for, oh, close to a year. And during the mechanical rehab, we had the bridge out of service for only three months. And the reason that was difficult is that we're an active navigation project, and we had to keep the canal open to navigation, so the span had to be in the up position. Now, that's just the opposite of how the bridge was built. The bridge was built uh, with the span in the down position. So this time, when we did the rehab, we had to lock the span in the up position. Supports had to be installed from the water piers up to the underside of the span to hold it in place. We had to jack up the counterweights to release the tension on the cables and then change out the cables. While we were doing that, we removed the shivs up in the wheelhouse. We stripped the electrical and mechanical guts out of the bridge for the first time in 70 years and replaced it all so that we could minimize the, the impact of, of having the bridge out of service. Right now, these bridges are over 70 years old. We expect that they'll last at least another 50, maybe even another 70 years old. With proper maintenance, we expect these bridges will easily stand up to the test of time. In addition to overseeing bridge maintenance and marine traffic, the Army Corps of Engineers operates the Cape Cod Canal as part of a federal recreation area. There are approximately 3.5 million visitors each year who enjoy 20 miles of public shoreline and 1,100 acres of adjoining public parklands. I think the Cape Cod Canal is a great success story, not only for navigation purposes, but because of all the other opportunities it affords the public. We are a navigation project, and that's why we're here, to provide that function. But we have a recreational component of the canal, which has developed over the years, and everything's free here at the canal. The survival of the canal has been guaranteed by its many years of irrefutable success. It's really a marvel. Of all the years I've lived by the canal, I have to tell you, every time I see a boat, I stop and look at it. It's an unbelievable sight, and it doesn't cost you a penny. It's the greatest free gift that's ever been given to the people around here. For nearly a century, Progress hasn't diminished the need for a protected sea route along the eastern seaboard. The Cape Cod Canal has provided safe passage for millions of vessels and saved countless lives from the North Atlantic's fury.
This man knew his invention could change the world, but he didn't do it for science or even the money. He did it for a reason few might suspect. Alexander Graham Bell's incredible machine was inspired by his work with people who couldn't even hear. Don't miss Alexander Graham Bell and the Astonishing Telephone on Man Moment Machine.